Well, I've got one of my health heroes that I've known for many years on the show. It's taken me a year to pin him down. He's an absolute genius. I see this man as a genius. Why? Because he's committed himself to changing people's lives for over 30 to 40 years. Since 1985, I think, he started looking at cell biology, uh, stem cells. His research is extensive. I started speaking about his work in the early 2000s when I started lecturing on neuroscience. This is one of my top three books, everybody, on YouTube, The Biology of Belief. We're going to unpack this. We're going to put it through a few narratives because this man looks like he's getting younger and younger, although the years are going by. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Dr. Bruce Lipton. I am so happy to be here with you, and I so appreciate what you're doing, opening up an awareness to the public because knowledge is power, and there's been a lack of knowledge to help us move forward, and I, I know that your history and your work is all uh, in alignment to help us move forward in this world because we're in an evolutionary upheaval at this moment. Yep, absolutely agree. Well, for the tribe that's listening, he's an international expert bridging science and the spirit, which we're going to have a look at. <laughs> he's waving. We're going to have a lot of fun. I can see it in the show. And he is an epigenetic pioneer. We're going to look at that, which is really, he's a best-selling author. I think six books now, Bruce. Is that correct? No, just three. Just three. three. Okay. But if you buy two each, that's six. <laughs> <laughs> best-selling author, cell biology. Give us a short backstory, Bruce. Uh, I want to suck every single minute I can in the next hour from you. Uh, I think your uh, feel that your brain works at and your mind works at is at another level of consciousness. <laughs> Tell us about a short backstory of what happened in the 80s, when your eureka moment was and the revelation that has come to you. And why is it so difficult for that revelation to come to other people? Oh, wow. Well, uh... <laughs> The whole idea is uh, if I go back to that time period, I was teaching medical students uh, about the nature of genes and a process called genetic determinism, which most people still believe in, that meaning genes control the character of your life. And uh, you have to understand something. What does that teaching imply? And it implies this. As far as you know, you didn't pick the genes you came with. And if you don't like the traits you have, you can't change the genes. And then you're told the genes turn on and off by themselves. And I say, you put all that together and guess what? You become a victim of your heredity. You're a victim of your DNA. It's like oh, cancer's running in the family, Alzheimer. I'm going to get all these things. And that puts fear into a pe people's head. So the whole idea was I was teaching this concept that genes control your life. And I was working on stem cells. Uh, and just so people get an understanding, a stem cell is the equivalent of an embryonic cell in your body. And I go, why? Uh, first, very important point, a body is not a single thing. It's made out of 50 trillion cells. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I always wonder, how big is a trillion? Well, it would take you thousands of years to start from one to get to a trillion. Wow. <laughs> and that's wow. counting every day, 24 hours a day. Wow. So all of a sudden, it's like, well, that number is bigger than you can ever imagine. So there's 50 trillion of these cells like amoebas living inside of us, and that's who we are, community. But every second, uh, hundreds of thousands of cells die every second. I mean, we, since we've been on, people have lost us many million cells by now. And I go, oh my God, if we're losing cells that fast, then how can we stay alive? And then comes the point is that in our cellular population, there are stem cells, which are another word for embryonic cell and they replace anything that's lost so that you keep maintaining your life day after day, even though you're losing hundreds of billions of cells every day. So I say, so what's the point? I'm working with embryonic stem cells. I'm growing them in a tissue culture. Uh, I create a situation where I have genetically identical cells, 30,000 genetically identical cells because they came from one parent cell. And I say, what do I do? I split the dishes uh, the, the cells, 30,000, 10,000 into each of three dishes. And then uh, I grow the cells in culture medium. That's a laboratory version of blood. So if I grow human cells, I say, what is human blood made out of? And then I make culture medium in the lab. Well, since I make the culture medium, I changed and made three different chemical versions of culture medium. But all the cells are genetically identical. So I feed the cells with different culture medium, different blood. Okay, and in one dish, the cells form muscle, in another dish, they form bone, in a third dish, the cells form fat cells. And then I'm left by looking at this going, oh my God, 
they're all genetically identical. What made them muscle, bone, or fat? The, you know, and the answer was not the genes. It was the environment. The chemistry of the culture medium controls genes. And they go, oh, well, that sounds like an interesting experiment. I say, now, now let's go back one step and go, remember I said you're 50 trillion cells. Well, you're a skin-covered Petri dish. That's inside of you is 50 trillion cells living in you. And I say, and they have the original culture medium, which is blood. I go, yeah, that's the original culture medium. Then I say, what? It doesn't make a difference if the cell is in a plastic dish or in a skin dish. It's still controlled by the culture medium. So I go, okay, wait. I, I'm a skin covered culture dish. I got original culture medium blood, but the chemistry of the blood controls the genes. And I say, most important question. Well, then who's the chemist in your body to make sure what chemistry is in there because that chemistry is gonna control your genes. So I go, yeah, I go, the brain is the chemist. And then the ultimate search goes, well, what chemicals should the brain be putting into the body? And here's the amazing answer. Whatever picture you hold in your mind, whether it's love or fear or anger or whatever that picture is, the brain translates that into complementary chemistry. There's a blood chemistry for love, which includes dopamine for pleasure and oxytocin to bond you with your lover and vasopressin makes you more attractive to keep your partner and growth hormone, which, you know, says what it does. I say, so why is the point? A picture of love releases those chemicals into your blood, culture medium, 50 trillion cells. I go, why is that relevant? Because that chemistry gives you vitality and health. That's why when people fall in love, they go, oh, see how in love they are, see how they glow? That glow is health. I go, oh, so a picture of love releases those chemicals. Yeah, but I say, what about a picture of fear? I go, that's a different chemicals come out. That's where stress hormones come out and factors that shut down the immune system start to come out in stress. So I go, oh, simple conclusion. All the cells have the same genes, but what makes them healthy cell, a muscle cell, a skin cell, a cancer cell, whatever cell wasn't controlled by the genes. It was controlled by the blood, which is then controlled by your consciousness, your whatever you perceive, whether it's love or fear, that changes the culture medium, that changes your genetics. I go, what's the relevance? Thank you for letting me talk, Sam. Uh, <laughs> uh, Stevie, baby, uh, let, let's get on to the yeah. show here where I have to say, what does all of this mean, Steve? And, yeah, and, sure. and the answer comes down to this. The answer is simply that um, whatever you're thinking, controls your biology. I say, why is that re relevant? I said, because we were teaching and most people still believe genes control their life. And I go, that makes you a victim. But now it turns around, it's like, no, your consciousness, your visions, that controls your life. I go, so why is that relevant? Because we control the vision. Yeah. And all of a sudden it says, so I'm not a victim of the genes. I am manifesting genes. So I say, why is it relevant? I say, well, simple point. A lot of think, people think, oh, cancer is caused by a gene. I guess what? Not one gene causes cancer. Huh? We got all these cancer genes. I say, they don't cause cancer. Uh, uh, you know, let's say women are most concerned about breast cancer gene. And, uh, uh, you know, if they have that breast cancer gene, it's like, oh, my God, I'm going to get the breast cancer. And Angelina Jolie, an actress, mm. uh, had a double mastectomy. She, I'm going to use the words, though people don't want to hear it, mutilated, <laughs> mutilated yeah. her body in fear of having a cancer because she has a gene. And I go, well, wait a minute, 50% of the women that have that gene never get the cancer. I go, so what does that mean? It means if you have the gene, it doesn't mean you get the cancer. It's a lifestyle that causes that, an unhealthy lifestyle. And I go, why is it relevant? Because they're blaming the gene, which makes, I can't do anything about it. I got cancer, I got the gene. I go, no, the gene didn't cause that. It was the way you were living and the way you see the world and how you, your, your environment around you. And I go, why is it relevant? Because we control that. We control what environment, we control our thoughts. And I say, why is it relevant? Then I'm not a victim. I am the master of my genetics. And all of a sudden I say, yeah, because 
uh, it turns out uh, your mind has been programmed <laughs> and the program runs 95% of your life and you didn't even put the program in there. So all of a sudden uh, you're a victim, not of your genes, but of your program. Yeah. Uh, and to give an example of that. Important point, uh, I think uh, you're not a victim of your situation, of your genes. You've got to create that life. It reminds me of Nelson Mandela, Bruce. You know, I think his programs, 27 years in prison, you know, we've got a huge, unfortunate, black, white, you know, racist history here. Um, but now we're, we're, we're living, like, we're living that here in the US. <laughs> it yeah, hasn't gone yeah. away. It was yeah. under the covers, but it's always been there. Yeah. So these programs, unfortunately, determine a lot of people's not only their actions, but their lifestyles and behaviors. This, oh, it controls this. every character of your life is under your control. Uh, and, and this becomes so profoundly important because there's a tendency to blame things that happen to you on other people because it's, I, I wouldn't want to hurt myself. I go, not in your conscious creative mind, the one connected to your spirituality, but your subconscious, the program mind. I'll give an example. Uh, they follow what happens to kids that get adopted into a family where there's cancer running in the family. And I say the adopted child, this is an important point. The adopted child, when put into that family, will get the same cancer that the family has, but the adopted child came from totally different genetics. Yeah. The point was, it wasn't the genes that caused yeah. cancer. It's a lifestyle that's not in harmony with the 50 trillion cells in your community. Right. And I say, right. so why is it relevant? Because as you know, uh, Steve, you've been doing it for how many years? I don't know how many years. 23 been, years. You, you have known for all that time yeah. that understanding, uh, well, the traditional Chinese medicine, which is all based on environment, yeah. 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 <laughs> has been there for thousands of years and is still one of the most accurate interpretations mm -hmm. about the nature of what goes on in that environment inside, yeah. that community inside because it's the environment that is shaping the expression of that cells. Yeah. Uh, and I say, so why is it relevant? Well, I'm the one that chooses the environment. Yeah. I'm yeah. the one that accepts what's going on and, mm. and, and didn't change anything. So whatever it is, uh, and to summarize it, because I'm, I, I got a million words, you know. So uh, <laughs> sum, sum, summarize, here's a summary, okay? The movie, The Matrix is a documentary why? Because the truth is, everyone has been programmed. And this is a requirement of child development in the first seven years of life. This is a program period. Uh, and, and I say, so why is it why, why program? And then a simple point, the brain is a computer, the best one ever. I go, so why is it relevant? I say, well, it's just, it has the same functions as a, a laptop, let's say. I go, so why? I say, go to the store, buy a brand new laptop, bring it home, push start, it boots up. Now I say, okay, do something, make a drawing, you know, write a story, do a spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. And you go, I can't do it. I go, why not? You got a brand new computer. I go, not until I install the programs is the computer useful. And I go, the brain is a computer. It has a startup in the last trimester of pregnancy, three months before you're born, starting up, boots, but the rest of the net of the pregnancy and seven years is download program. So you, when you're seven years old, get to control the machine. You get to type on the computer. You get to put program. You can change anything. But you cannot, as a child, have a brain that can boot up with no programs because it will not do anything. And then the programs come from what? Uh, the child's brain is in hypnosis for seven years whatever it sees, it downloads like video camera. So I go, so who's it observing? Mother, father, their behavior, family behavior, community behavior. And I go, why is that relevant? You got to know a lot of information to be part of the culture. <laughs> you can't just make up stuff. You have to conform. And I say, so how's an infant, a young kid going to learn 100,000 rules? I say, hypnosis. It just watches the father and says, that's how a father acts. Oh, watching a mother, that's the behavior a mother has. And that's the neighbor's community behavior. And I go, so why is it relevant? It was downloaded without mm -hmm. the, you know, the child being aware that they were copying behavior of other people so they conform.
okay? I go, yeah, but what if those other people have problems? And I go, well, you just downloaded them as well. Yeah. And this is why things run in families because it's not the genes. The behavior is downloaded from the last trimester to seven years. That's as a, that more important than the genes. Why? Because that behavior switches the genes to control to the picture. Mm -hmm. And if you change the picture, your world changes. Yeah. And this isn't similar. this... You know, this sort of thinking, uh, Bruce, is not understood. It's the central dogma that genes control your life is not taught at medical schools. It isn't understood. Doctors don't spend time on your thinking, on your belief. You know, can you they summarize? Did. They, you yeah. know, they did. They did, Steve, because a while back, most doctors were called family practitioners. And I said, what does that mean? One doctor knows one family. And I go, why were they useful? Because they knew the dynamics, the relationships, what was going on. So when they were, uh, you know, diagnosing a situation, they included the significance of the family's role in that individual's health. Okay. Uh, and this is so important because family practitioners are the ones that know the environment of their patients. And I go, so now what do we have? Well, we have specialists. I go, so what? They have no, a patient comes in, they look at them separate from the world. Oh, you're in my observation room. I'm going to look at you. W what about the job? W what about the, the spouse? Uh, what about the kids? What about their influences? No, specialist says, I'm a heart doctor. I just look at your heart. Oh, no, I'm a neuro doctor. I just look at your neurons, okay? And I go, why is it relevant? Y you can't look at a little piece and understand that what's is. going on in life. Uh, and this is where traditional Chinese medicine comes in and yeah. says, no, there's an environment yeah. that you must incorporate because it's the environment that shapes reality. And all of a sudden, uh, Chinese medicine becomes, uh, uh, there, there was a quote from a, a, a famous uh, author in the US, Mark Twain. Yeah. Uh, uh, and a famous quote is, the older I get, the smarter my father becomes. Okay. Uh, exactly. And I go, why is that relevant? I said, the older we get as a civilization, the smarter earlier people yeah. were that we didn't realize it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and Chinese medicine has been around a lot oh, longer God. than Western yeah. medicine. Yeah. Uh, and people say, well, it doesn't work. I go, oh, it's been here thousands of years. What, yeah. what do you think? It's here because it doesn't work? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But what I'm talking about is this Western traditional model that even the medical doctors, the general practitioners here in South Africa spend 10 minutes with you. That's it. They write a script. They're not looking at your sort of environment. They're not looking at your relationships, your purpose. So it's pretty much broken down to a point where we write your script, we write your medicines, and you, you, know, you go and deal with that. And people have given accountability to the doctor instead of accountability of their own health. Because remember that seven years of programming uh, is learn where we learn how to be in the world. And the one thing that we start to learn very early on, there are professionals that know stuff and we are not professionals. So what do we learn as kids? Well, if you're sick, you don't take care of it. You, you go to the doctor. That's a professional. I say, so what is the program? And the program is rather than following my truth, I will take the word of this professional because mm -hmm. they know. And I go, so why is that relevant? I go, because then if a doctor makes a prognosis of what's going to happen, he's actually creating a script <laughs> for your yeah. life. Yeah. And you will manifest every damn thing in that prognosis, even if you have no disease, because your belief system says whatever that person says overrides whatever I yeah. think. And all of a sudden, then you have given up controlling your life to somebody uh, who, as you just mentioned, the education, conventional education, uh, uh, is failing. Yeah. Uh, and I say, How, how's it failing? And then I, I, I give a number that's, okay, this is exciting. Uh, and I think it was uh, about 10 years ago uh, in the Journal of the American Medical Association. So this is a journal of, for, of the doctors. You know, it's the union. Mm -hmm. I go, so what, what did they have? There was an article on that medicine was the third leading cause of death in the United States. That first was heart issues, second was cancer, cancer. and cancer. third had a, a name that people then didn't really yeah. get. That was the yeah. cool part because yeah. the name was called iatrogenic illness. Yeah. Everybody goes, oh yeah, it must be a virus. I go, no, iatrogenic illness means illness as a result of medical treatment. So that the third leading cause of death 
And that was over 10 years ago, uh, more than 10 years ago. Uh, uh, I think it was around 2000, actually. Sure. Uh, and that was in the medical journal. Guess wow. what? It was done. The same research was just done again two years ago in the British Medical Journal about the U.S. Medicine is still the third leading cause of death. Wow. And I go, why is it relevant? And the answer is because the training is manipulated by the pharmaceutical industry because of the money. And as a result, alternative complementary concepts of healing are excluded from the conventional medical training. So when a medical doctor hears that, oh, you know, some acupuncture person did this, they go, yeah, yeah, you know, it's yeah. like, that's not in our world. And yeah. they ignore that. And I go, that's the ignorance by blinders. Mm. And, and the fact is, no, energy medicine, traditional Chinese medicine, feng shui, yeah. <laughs> has been telling us about environment controlling our lives for thousands of years. And so uh, the older we're getting, finally, we're recognizing, oh, mm. they were pretty smart back then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, Bruce, I want you to define in simple terms for people listening out there, the word belief, you know, uh, the Greek word belief is bistevo. It's a really strong word. It means to be fully persuaded and convinced. You know, it's the word in English is almost like maybe I believe that Dr. Lipton's got a pink Lamborghini. You know, it's, uh, it's quite flippant. But the Greek word is no. It's 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 green. It's not pink. No, I just made that up. I don't. I don't have a Lamborghini. Now. <laughs> but you hear what I'm saying? That word. Would you define belief? Is it a field? Is it an energy? Is it a wave? What is belief? Belief is an energy, because I can put wires on your head, and I could read your brain function, which is a conscious processing. And I can assign it to different vibrational energy frequencies, okay? And we talk about different levels of vibration, the lowest one, delta. When the brain is in delta, the body's at rest or sleep. Yeah. And then theta is imagination, but it's also hypnosis. And then you, once you get into alpha, higher vibration, now you begin consciousness. Below alpha, unconscious. Alpha is conscious around seven, and around 12, you even jump up to a higher one called beta, which is schoolroom. Okay, so I say, why is it relevant? Because consciousness is, is read as an energy vibrational field. <laughs> <laughs> and I say, so why is it relevant? Because it's, it, consciousness is a, is a creation of your brains and your neurons and all that stuff. That's how I can read it. And so it's like, oh, so what is creating consciousness? Energy fields, okay? Uh, uh, and then what I <laughs> blew my mind because I wasn't a spiritual person. I was a conventional, you know, allopath doctor trainer. You know, I was training doctors with conventional stuff about genes and all that. Spirituality, we never even use that word because people look at you in science going, oh, what a crazy guy. Uh, uh, but once I started to study the cells and started to recognize that the brain of the cell was not the nucleus, the nucleus is the gonad reproduction. Okay. But it doesn't determine what's being reproduced when and how and what its function. The nucleus is just a hard drive in a computer with programs, genetic programs. And I go, so why was it relevant? Because when I started to look at the membrane, which is the brain membrane <laughs> of the, of the cell. Uh, I recognized there were a set of antennas called receptors built into the membrane. Now, that's parallel to a human because I have receptors. I got eyes, nose, ears, taste, touch. Uh, I got all these things. I say, where are they? They're built into my skin. What do they do? They read the environment and then I adjust my behavior. Well, there's a set of receptors that are unique to each individual. No two people have the same set. They're called... Oh, self receptors and i go so why was that relevant once i started to understand especially the quantum physics of the energy and the vibration and the antennas and the vibration and all that i said oh my god each of us has a set of antennas receiving an environmental energy vibration that is unique to each one of us because it's like uh you have a radio and you have let's say the am or the fm band whatever and as you turn the dial, you go from one station to another station to another station, et cetera. I say, well, human energy 
is like the radio band, but each of us is like one vibrational station, another vibrational. So each of us is a unique vibration. Yeah. I go, so yeah. why is it relevant? Because what causes that vibration is not built into the body. It's out here in the environment. And I go, oh, so each of us is receiving a vibrational signature because each of us has a different set of antennas. So each of us is a different station. And when I saw that, I said, oh, Jesus, people, oh my God, what does this mean? And it meant to me, because I wasn't spiritual, in an instant, I said, oh my God, I'm not in here. I am a broadcast being received by my self receptors, different than Steve's self receptors. He's got his own broadcast. Everyone's got their own broadcast. I go, well, but what was the point? And the point was this analogy you're watching a television picture you're watching a show and the television breaks and we say television is dead and i go yep we're not working anymore but the question is is the broadcast that was the show still there even if the television is broken yeah, it is. Of course it is. and then all of a sudden i said in an instant from not spiritual in an <laughs> instant in one minute boom i went out the other side because all of a sudden i said Oh my God, the body is like the television and the broadcast that we're receiving unique to each individual is being picked up by the antennas. And I go, so what? If the body dies, the broadcast is still there. Yeah. And I said, oh, a guy who never believed in spirituality in one minute yeah. went from, oh, there's no such thing as spirituality to, <laughs> oh my God, it's spirituality. Yeah. It's a spiritual realm. There's a spiritual realm. Is a it, different it, it entanglement. Yeah, it, yeah. It's very powerful. And here's what, what was the most powerful instant moment of my life at that moment of recognizing antennas, self, broadcast, spirit, uh, and quantum physics is involved. So I, I, and I stopped and I said, oh my God, I can't die. And all of a sudden, my life got so light, like helium. I just started floating more. And biologically, I recognize what the point is. And here it is. Every one of us out there at this time, during our development for seven years programming, has recognized the belief that as you, you start to grow, you get older and older and older and older. And then you reach a point where you start to go downhill and then you end up dying. And that's a belief. Yeah. I go, so why is it relevant? Well, if belief is controlling your life, then what do you think you're, you're doing to yourself? Okay. So... I started to recognize this and I go, oh my God, I can't die. And I say, again, why? Because one of the earliest beliefs that we get is whether we're safe or we're not safe. I go, from what? From being hurt or dead? Because we can watch people die and you go, I don't want to die. And then all of a sudden the fear of, oh my God, where do you go? And what happens or nothing or whatever? The fear. I go, when did that fear start? I said, about five years of age. Before that, there was no fear. Child has no fear, but they learn. And then I say, so why is it relevant? Because the fear becomes overriding and uh, there's a drive for all organisms. The word is called biological imperative. What's that? There's a drive in every organism from the most primitive bacteria to the most advanced organisms on this planet. It's called the drive to survive. I go, what do you mean? I say, you try and kill a bacteria, just a bacterium, a single bacterium. You try and kill it. And I say, you think it's going to sit there and say, okay, kill me? Absolutely not. It's going to exercise every possible opportunity in its behavior to stay alive. I go, the most primitive organism has a drive to stay alive. You try to kill it, it's going to avoid it. I go, from there on. And I go, and what does it mean? We all have a built-in biological imperative. Uh, and there's two levels to that survival of the self and survival of the community yeah. two levels okay yeah. and yeah. survival of the self is what you need to survive air water food you know protection from outside protection from threats and all of a sudden you start to see i i need all these things to survive okay and, and then you put the threats of survival in there and all of a sudden you see people being reactive trying to survive with threat and the world is in a state of threat. I presume South Africa is in the same state yeah. of threat everywhere else is at this moment. Yeah. And what's the fear? We're dying. <laughs> yeah. The civilization, human civilization is, is on its way out. Mm. 
And I go, why? Because we are destroyed the environment that created yeah. us. Yeah. We came yeah. from this world, from the nature, and now we're at the top and what have we done? Destroyed underneath. And all of a sudden, what does that mean? You cannot sustain human civilization if nature collapses. That's right. And now I want to ask you, so we've defined what is belief, but what determines belief? Is it just the programs from until the age of seven? Is it trauma? I'll give you an example. There's a family, they've got four kids. They're raised in a loving family. One of them is very optimistic. One of them is filled with joy. He's watched, maybe the third one had some trauma. You know, there are house invasions in South Africa here. There's a house invasion. Fear comes, anxiety comes. The words Absolutely. that come from mother and father are not strong enough. They're not, that word isn't, doesn't carry the weight and the power to overcome the trauma. So what determines belief according to you? Okay, the, we're a learning mechanism. And, and, and the idea is the nervous system is open to learning. That's what a child's moment is born is like, wow, where am I? Look at this, crazy, you know? And the idea is you start learning. Interesting, there was a Star Trek uh, episode where Data, which is like a bionic human, uh, they make a chip that has emotions. He had no emotions, he was cold. And then they put the chip in and all of a sudden it's life like, you know, feeling, smelling, touching and all these things that, you know, uh, and it was interesting because in the beginning, he didn't distinguish things that were bad from things that were feelings that were bad from good, you know. But all of a sudden he started to recognize some things made him feel better, some things made him feel worse. And all of a sudden there were emotions that were then controlling that, that life. And the emotions are based on the experience. If he ate chocolate, that was really good. If he ate something that was foul, yeah. it, it, at first if something foul, he didn't know what foul was. That was like, wow, that's a taste. But then it started to recognize some tastes were <laughs> negative and some tastes were positive. And we are like that as children. We grow up, we have experiences. And then, so that, that's the important part. And I say, so what's different about one child and another in the same family? And the answer is, what were the experiences of the parents, especially to the first child, when they never had a child? And it's like, oh my God, raising a child. The second one comes around and goes, okay, we did that. <laughs> well, that's a whole different behavior for the second child. The first child never got that behavior, you know? And all of a sudden you start to recognize that um, the child's reflecting where the parents and the world was at the time they were in that program. Okay. And so the first child has a different behavior than the second child and the third child uh, and each of them because the environment was different. So let's say the second child gets now the parents wake up and they're really big, good conscious parents and I go great. But then uh, there's a house break in and fear comes in that wasn't there before and it wasn't in the parents but it's also now in the kid. So uh, an event like that all of a sudden becomes traumatic for the child as well. The child is, is downloading life experiences and they're good experiences and they're threatening experiences. And the threatening ones have more power because the threatening one you could die with. <laughs> good ones, you could be alive all the time, no problem, but a threatening one could kill you. So we pay more attention to the fear. I go, so why is it relevant? Then your behavior it's always under, you know, scrutiny by the brain that's looking for what? Threats. You walk down the street, it's a beautiful sunny day, the shops are open and everything. I go, but if you live in fear and you walk down that street, you're not going to see the beautiful thing. You're going to be looking in the shadows. Who's the threat? Is that person, they looked at me very threateningly and I go, oh my God, they walked down this beautiful heaven on earth scene and didn't see the scene because they were so afraid from previous life experiences yeah. that their, their threat level is high. And I say, so what happened at the moment I, I recognized immortality of my identity field? And the answer was, I got lighter. I go, what was the lighter about? And I said, you don't realize how much energy the subconscious mind is using 24 seven to make sure your environment is safe. While you're walking down the street and daydreaming, whatever, the subconscious is the one that looks at every threatening possible opportunity that you could be affected by. The subconscious is doing this every moment you're alive because its job is to protect you. I go, 
then what happens if all of a sudden you say, I'm not afraid? I go, all that energy that was operating when you didn't even see it because it's operating 24 seven, all of a sudden, if you lose that fear, the amount of energy you just recovered from what? I'm not using that fear scanner, (laughs) which is going every minute of awake moment I'm stop using it. I go, but it it took energy to drive. And I go, yeah. And guess what happens? The moment you don't need it, there's a return of energy that almost like, because it's so quick, disconnect, cut the wire. I'm not in fear. But how do we, how do we cut that wire? Because those neural pathways are so ingrained. People's program has been so used. The more you use the program, the more that pathway easy, just default setting, default setting, automation. It's faster and faster. The response is faster each time because it's practice, it's habit. So you have to break a habit. (laughs) And this is the issue where our belief issue is like, well, I okay, I believe uh, that uh, you know I'm not uh, in fear. I believe I can do things or something. And well, let me give you an example. Okay, I've got a five-year-old. Okay, she's a beautiful young young daughter of mine. I've got a seventeen-year-old. I've never missed a day's work in twenty-three years. I love my work. We've got a motto here at Made to Thrive. It's called TGIM. Thank God it's Monday. Monday's my <laughs> favorite day of the week because people are waiting for weekends. They're waiting for holidays. They don't enjoy work. Work is bad. Weekends are good. Holidays are good. Work is unpleasurable. So now I've got my daughter, but now with the corona, she's running around saying, Dad, where's the virus? Where's the virus? At school, they're saying, I've got to sanitize. I've got to wear this. I've got to wear that. Where's the virus going to get me? Now, she's in a home where we are really, we use NLP, we self-actualize, we love our lives, we love work, we've been a family of faith, hope, and love. But now, her whole life over the last 15 months has changed. Absolutely. There's an evolution here, and it's a a destructive phase. This is not our evolution, this is devolution. I go, why? Evolution is recognizing that all humans are part of one single living organism called humanity. Each of us is a cell in the body of a bigger thing, humanity. I go, so why is it relevant? The moment you start killing other cells, that's called autoimmune disease. I go, the biggest problems on this planet are autoimmune disease within the 50 trillion cell community inside, responding to the same consciousness that I'm using with my community outside. So whatever I'm experiencing, I experience it physiologically as well as behaviorally because it's the same thing. Uh, and the issue is this, is that fear is, is the, the total control. I can offer you love and you go, that's really nice. And I love that. That would be really great. And if I tell you about fear, you're going to go, what? And then you're going to be right out there. Why? Fear threatens the biological imperative. And that the evolution is all of us coming together, recognizing the unity of all human beings as cells in a giant organism. But what the world is experiencing now is not a coming together of community. It's a division of community, a separation. Don't talk to these people, hide in your house, keep social distancing, wear the mask so nobody can see you and what you're saying in your mind by looking at your face. And I go, why is this relevant? And I said, this is anti-evolution. This is taking us away. And here's the most important point, because South Africa has been through this. The U.S. was through it a little earlier, but the same evolution. Uh, And the point about all this is that um, we have to learn that every human is a piece of that infinite God, whatever it is, all that is. Each of us is a unique station on the broadcast of doing this. And and that if you kill or harm another person, it would be the same as in your body, one organ attacking another organ. Well, that's called autoimmune disease. I go, well, that's self-destruction on the inside, and this is self-destruction on the outside, mm-hmm. and this separation. And, uh, you know, I'm very outspoken about this because yeah. I've been not just a biologist and a cell biologist for 50, 60 years now, whatever, it's a long time, uh, <laughs> uh, that, um, but it's more than that. The, 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 what, what's going on in here is this program called COVID, is one of the most distant powering systems to be run on people because of the media. And you go, well, what do you mean about the media? Well, let me give you the first big important fact. 
stress hormones shut down the immune system because they, they want to get the energy to run away from the tiger. The immune system protects you on the inside. And it uses a lot of energy because when you're sick, some people don't have energy to get out of bed. So when the immune system is fully operating, you, you are weak. I go, so what, well, here's the problem. I have a bacterial infection. I'm ch being chased by a saber tooth tiger. Okay, I'm not too worried about the bacterial infection because if the tiger eats yeah. me, that's not gonna be a yeah. problem. So the stress of running away from the tiger, the stress hormones, shut down the function of the immune system that can serve energy so I could run away. I go, so what does it mean? I go, because the public has been put into the situation by fear and, and it's manipulated by fear. And I go, is the fear real? I said, nope, it's broadcast fear. Why? 80 to 90% of people have the COVID, never went to a doctor, never went to a hospital. They had a sustained flu. 80 to 90 percent and I go why is it relevant well the first thing is this this COVID is not lethal <laughs> but so many people died I go the ones that died have what are called comorbidities yeah. I go what are those things that uh, are in the body that are in disharmony that are impacting the immune system by you know taking away power from it I say like what Overweight, 78% of the people in hospitals from COVID are overweight. 75% of them have stress and heart problems. Uh, there's there's uh, diabetes and overweight and stress and all these. And these are called comorbidities. I go, why is it relevant? If you have comorbidities, that's a sign you're not healthy. That's yeah. the first thing. 60% right. yeah. 60 of Americans, six out of 10, have one comorbidity. Yeah. But, but. Four out of 10 Americans have between two and three comorbidities yeah. at the same time. I say, what's irrelevant? They are physiologically broken. Yeah. I go, why is it relevant? And they always say, well, to protect yourself, you do A, B, C, wear the mask, go to, you know, separate, blah, blah, blah. And at the very end, they say, and, and be healthy. I go, are you kidding me? Be That's healthy the should be the number one yeah. because yeah. healthy people have no serious negative mm. consequences of this thing okay yeah, that's right that's right and, and, and the idea is they're not encouraging health they're encouraging fear and i go mm. why because if i scare you you're going to mm. release stress hormones then what's going to happen i go you just shut down the immune system yes. the yeah. more fear you're in and i have a uh, a report from a british newspaper called the telegraph and it's an excerpt from a government advisory panel on pandemics. And guess what they said? And it's like written right out of the meeting of this group. And they said, the people are not afraid enough. Yeah. For what? To get the vaccine. Yeah. So the, the mission statement of this group was, we must make the public more afraid. I go, holy crap. Yeah. The more afraid they are, the weaker the immune system yeah. is. You're perpetuating this because you're scaring the hell out of everybody yeah. because of fear. Fear releases stress hormones. Stress hormones by function shut down the immune system. Who the hell are you helping with your fear every day? I said, you're making it worse. Yeah. Well, they want to make it worse because they want to enslave the population. When they want to control the population, you talk about the matrix. They just want you as a resource to drain you of all your resources and in, ensure that they can control you via health and finances, enslave you to finances and enslave Fear. you. Fear. Yeah. They, yeah. they got you to be afraid. Yeah. And, and it's really interesting because um, a British parliamentarian that I use an excerpt from Michael Moore movie yeah. uh, called yeah. Sicko. Yeah, I know. Sicko. I the excerpt is from uh, Tony Benn, a former member of parliament. And he just clearly comes out and says, Governments do not want a healthy, intelligent population because they are difficult to control. Yeah. And then he said, you scare the people, and then what do they do? They just lower their heads and follow the plan because they don't want to get involved. They yeah. just, whatever you say, I'm going to do it. And I go, that was from a movie from a while back. Yeah. And I go, yeah. this is exactly what the fear situation is. Evolution is to bring the community together. Mm -hmm. COVID story is to separate the community. Why? Because people have no power yeah. as yeah. individuals. Yeah. And, and you ought to know this in South Africa from what you've been through in a more recent time than what we went through uh, with the same thing. Uh, because when you disempower the public, 
they're they're slaves to whatever the yeah. hell the, the storyline exactly. is. I want to go back to my daughter and I've got to reprogram the sphere that's happened because of COVID. She's five years old. We spent a lot of time, a lot of love, a lot of faith, a lot of hope. We're, we're a family where people come into our home and they say there's peace here. They've seen angels in our home. We're, we're a very spiritual family. Yet this has yes. come along and the environment, the field that has been generated, this quantum field, wherever we go, wherever she goes, and she's more susceptible to that she's in the learning she that's the part we talked yeah. about the experiential yeah. part to create a life now i'm speaking to dr lipton what do i do with my five-year-old daughter what is the process how do i do this how do i take her and break those you know dr caroline leaf she knows you on my podcast cleaning up your mental mess trying to go through a program how do we go and reset the subconscious automation you know brick by brick tell me dr okay. lipton okay Bruce, first of all, okay. Uh, <laughs> it's important that this, uh, at her age, she's downloading everything she's experiencing right now in her life. When she goes to school, she's downloading a public program. But when she's home, she downloads you. You have priority, you and your partner have priority over uh, anybody else's belief system because you are the first ones that they recognize as the safety mechanism. And so your idea is this, you have to just keep putting on the different story and demonstrating it by living that different story. We're okay, we're healthy, look, why? Because we're whatever reasons you want, and you repeat the story, why? Because a habit is created from repetition. You, you, wanna, you wanna ride a bike? Well, you gotta practice that thing and repeat it and repeat it till you could ride it or drive a car or play an instrument. And a belief is the same thing. You want to change a belief, then you have to habituate a new belief and repeat it and repeat it like that. And, and the most important thing that I think parents fail is they look at young children as, well, they're not really that comprehending of what's going on. They don't really, I have to talk to them in the child terms here. I go, absolutely not. That kid's brain is downloading stuff that has been downloading stuff for more than five years now because it was downloading before the, the child was born, okay? Uh, and we know that uh, uh, while a child's in the womb, whatever environmental situations are going on uh, will affect the fate of that child while it's still in the womb, okay? And now she's five and I say, so what? And I say, well, now you're more inclined to be the teacher and say, yes, the story outside isn't really, you know, that's not, you know, the, the truth is that you are powerful. The truth is you are a spiritual entity. At five years old, she's ready to download all that stuff right now. And talking to her with adult terms is like fabulous. Why? Because she's recording this. She's going to use this later. You say, if she won't understand these words, I say, give her a couple more years. Those words are all going to have meaning at that point. And so you are the guide, parents guide the fate of evolution because the programming the parents offer determine the rest of the life of that child. And the Jesuits, they, they have a saying for 400 years, they've told their followers exactly the truth and nobody really, I go, what did they say? For 400 years, they said, give me a child until it is seven and I will show you the man. I said, what does that mean? I said, it's exactly what we just talked about. The first seven years is programming. But what they knew and what most people don't know is that the rest of your life is 95% from that program. Only 5% are you using the creative conscious mind, the one with imagination and wishes and desires. Only 5% of the time. 95% you are automatically playing the programs you got in the first seven years. And if they're scary programs or fear-based programs, man, then 95% of your life is totally engaged in that. But then, as I said, the movie, The Matrix is true. It's documentary. And also I said, well, they had a red pill and a blue pill. I go, yeah, the blue pill, you take that and you wake up and the world's just the way it's always been. Okay. But if you take the red pill, you get out of the program. I go, so what's the result of getting out of the program? And the answer is, most people out there in this community have taken a red pill without even knowing they did it and their life profoundly changed in 24 hours. I go, what was that? If you fall in love with somebody, you meet somebody and you fall, oh my God, this is my love of my life, whether it is or not at that moment. <laughs> I go, what does it mean? And it means that you, you stay 
conscious, instead of defaulting to the program, instead of being only 5% of your life, your consciousness, it becomes 90%. I go, why is that relevant? Because you stopped playing the program when you fell in love. And I said, what was the result of falling in love? I go, your life was blah, 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 blah. You fall in love and 24 hours later, Oh, life is so beautiful. It's heaven. I love life. Even a crappy job is not so, I love my life. Why? Because you fell in love. I go, so what was the point? Science has recognized when you fall in love, you stop playing the program. I say, and what was the result? 24 hours later, you went from crap to heaven on earth. You tell me if that's not the most important thing in the whole world. And I go, why is it relevant? Because all of us, as the Jesuits knew, 95% is coming from the program because and you say, so why only 5% coming from conscious? And the answer is thinking is a function of the conscious mind. I go, so what? Well, observing your world is a function of the conscious mind. He goes, yeah, so? I said, but when you're thinking, you stop observing the world because thinking is inside. You turn your vision from looking out to start looking in. A thought is, Okay, uh, you know, Steve, tell me what you're doing on Sunday. And if it's not written in front of you, I bet you in a moment you could tell me where, where, what you're doing. I go, where'd you get the answer from? Oh, I was thinking about it. I said, where was thinking? Inside or outside? I was thinking it's inside. And I go, why is it relevant? You're driving a car and you're paying attention to where you're going, conscious mind. Then you start thinking. I say, but now the conscious mind's not looking out the window. It's looking inside. I go, holy crap, you're driving a car and your conscious mind's not even looking? And I go, subconscious programs are autopilot. The moment you're thinking, whatever behavior you're doing is now gonna be run by the program. I go, why is it relevant? The program didn't come from you, it came from other people. If you turn over the program and let them run your life, this is what, it might turn out to be a big pile of crap like their lives were. Yeah. Why? Because you're copying their behavior 95% of the day. You wanna change this? You have to change the subconscious. It's, I mean, while the child is under seven, the, the subconscious being programmed. So your work is easy in a sense that, well, you have to be, you know, present yourself to be that example that okay. your child is watching you 100% of the time. <laughs> and if you're like an average person, I go, so what does that mean? I say, well, 5% of the time I'm conscious. Oh, I'm going to be a conscious parent, creative, 5%. I go, I'm the parent, 5% I'm behaving in. This is what I would, this is a great life. But 95% of the parent's life is still coming from their program. Yeah. And all of a sudden, the child doesn't distinguish the parent from their parent's program. And they pass this down. And I go, this is like the cancer story. Cancer wasn't due to a gene. It was due to behavior that was not in harmony. Yeah. And that behavior is passed down. The cancer follows it on the way down. Yeah. So and with uh, alcoholism and, and those type of lifestyle habits, they get pre-programmed early on. Compensation. Yeah. Compensation. Tell us about neuroplasticity, neurogenesis until the age of 25, the brain development, how important that is. Even if someone's got those programs until seven, you know, I think the brain only fully develops till 25, but then it's not even fully developed. It's still neuroplastic. What is the latest research in science on neuroplasticity? Well, the fact is this, it's a learning mechanism. And if I mislearn, I can relearn. So I disconnect the old wires from the old belief and rewire the neurons to the new belief. But to do that, this is the difficult part mm. for the average person. Why? And the answer is this. Because the average person is operating from the program 95% of the day. I say, you want to change the program? I say, how do you change the program? I go, here's the problem. Programs are habits. I go, yeah, so what? And I go, well, Habits are required to make your life work. I go, what do you mean? I say, when did you learn how to walk? Before you were two. Yeah. I say, have you had to relearn how to walk? You could be 100 years old. I go, no, you've got the same power program. Thank God. Why? Because once a habit's in, it, it doesn't want to change. That's why it's called a habit. If it changes, then it's not called a habit. Yeah. So all of a sudden I say, wow, I put these programs in and I make habits good ones and bad ones based on whatever I download. I say, well, I want to change a habit. I go, it doesn't want to change. I said, well, then how do you change a habit? I said, how did you create a habit? Ah, because it's the only way you can change it. Well, not, I got to give you a new one in a minute, but uh, the two fundamental ways. I said, before age seven, you learned it because your brain was in a state of hypnosis. 
which is the conscious mind's not even working. Whatever's coming in is going straight into the program. It's not even going. That's the problem. We get programs while we're in hypnosis, but there's no conscious to filter the programs. So you get good programs, you get crap programs, but there's nobody filtering it. So you get all the programs, okay? So I go, so why is this relevant? I say, well, if you want to change a program, you, you can use hypnosis. I go, oh, does that mean I have to go see a hypnotherapist? I go, no, no. I go, why? I said, you have to be in theta. That's the, the, the below calm consciousness. That's even before consciousness. That's a lower vibration. And I go, so what is that? I said, remember the old story of hypnosis? Somebody would hold a watch and go back and forth. And they say, focus on the watch. And all of a sudden, what were you doing? You were lowering your vibration and you were going toward hypnosis. That's when, the, you know, it was. So I say, when you go to work in the morning, uh, let's say you're at work, you're at the high vibration beta. You come home after work and you start to relax, dinner and everything, and then your vibration is slower. It's called alpha. That's calm consciousness. But the moment you fall asleep, eyes closed, boom, gone. The next level of vibration operating is theta. Well, that's the hypnosis one. So I go, so what does that mean? I said, if you put earphones on, playing a program that you want to be in your life, a true program, you put the earphones on just as you're about to go fall asleep. And you might even hear some of the, you know, the whatever the program is. But the moment you fall asleep, conscious mind shut off. I go, yeah, so what? I say, subconscious mind is now recording. Wow. So that's called self-hypnosis. Put the earphones on and fall asleep with it. And it's like, how hard is that? And I go, that's the easiest study in the whole world. You fall asleep. It's downloading <laughs> for you. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and then I say, but how did you get programs after age seven? Because you're not in that brain state of, of record. I say, after age seven, you learn things by repetition. Whatever it is, you had to repeat it. <laughs> you know, how many times did you have to say the times table before you could say it without thinking about it? You know, how many times did you fall off the bicycle before you could learn how to ride? I go, you practice, practice, and then you made a habit. So. You want to change a habit? Self-hypnosis. That's a natural way. Okay. You got to every night, put the earphones on, listen to this. Okay. The other one is engage in a new behavior. You made behavior by practice. If you want to make a new behavior that's better, then engage in that behavior and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. And then at some point, you don't have to do it anymore because repetition is learning for subconscious. So the second way is, is uh, um, practice. First way, hypnosis, second way, practice. And those are two traditional ways that programs got in. Brilliant. Now, Brilliant. most important, uh, we're facing a, a, a global civilization calamity at this moment because of human behavior. And nature is calling on us to say, you guys want to stay alive as humans? You, you damn well better learn to change your behavior because your behavior is destructive of the world. And so we have to change behavior uh, uh, what do they say? Uh, necessity is the mother of invention. Uh, out of the necessity to rapidly change the world, now there's a new way to change subconscious beliefs. And it's called energy psychology. There are all these different modalities. And I say, well, what's unique about them? And I say, in some level, they engage something called super learning. Why the hell is super learning? I go, mm. seeing somebody read a book by opening a page and just moving their finger down. Just as fast as they move that finger down, they read every word on that page, just going like that. So it's a heightened sense of learning, okay? And energy psychology are modalities that engage that hyper learning thing that you can then rewrite programs in matters of minutes instead of the other two, which are time consuming repetitions, okay? And you can go in and, and, and change a belief in 15 minutes, okay? Of course, you, the harder part is to actually determine which belief you want to change and what program you want to put in. Once you got that, that is about 15 minutes of process you can get it to download. Yeah. So why is this relevant? The answer is because we're being called upon to change our behavior. And I say, well, how do I know what my programs are? Because I was programmed even before I was born. I was programmed a whole year from zero to one. What program did you, what, what program did you get, Steve? Zero to one. Can, no, I probably don't have a memory of that. How about from one to two? Nah, don't have much of a memory of that program. Two to three, I might be getting a little memory. And from three on, you might get some memory. But I say, 
Your fundamental programs came in. You have no idea what they are. You weren't there. You didn't filter them. So good and bad programs came in. So I say, how do I know what my programs are? And then the simple answer, 95% of my life is coming from the program. Point. My life is a printout of my program. What does that mean? I go, the things that I like that come into my life, they come in because I have a program to acknowledge that. But, big one, the things that I wish and desire for, but I struggle to get there, and I have to work hard, put a lot of energy into it, sweat over making it happen, I say, why are you working so hard? And the answer, inevitably, there's a program that doesn't support that conclusion. And you're trying to use a 5% of your day conscious mind to override 95% a day of playing that negative program. It's like, yeah, that's a bitch. <laughs> it's <laughs> a lot of work. Well, it doesn't work very well. Uh, uh, and so the idea about this is energy psychology cuts through that by opening up, activating the record process and allowing you to download a behavior in a very short time. And the behaviors are, well, what do you want to download? I said, what are you struggling to obtain in your world? And then uh, uh, let me add this because it's like, one of those facts that goes, you went right by and I go, no, I don't want this fact to go by. And an answer, the fact is this, quantum physics is the most valid science on the planet. There's been no science tested more and affirmed to be truer. I mean, quantum physics over biology, chemistry, psychology, all those other ones. I go, no, it's the science. I go, so why is it important? And the answer is, the fundamental principle of quantum physics that was put in on day one, 1927, is that consciousness is creating our life experience. If you wanna change your life, you don't go out and change the world. You change consciousness, the world then will change automatically. And I go, the most fundamental science in the world says consciousness is creating a world. And then I go, yeah. And then I go back and I say, yep. And you've been programmed for seven years with consciousness from other people. And most of them are carrying problems in their world and passing it on to you. So uh, cardiac disease is not genetic, it's lifestyle. Cancer is not genetic, it's lifestyle. Diabetes is not type two. It's not genetic, it's lifestyle. I go, oh my God. We keep attributing all the illnesses to genes and it turns out, no, it was programming. You wanna change the world? Today's the day to say, I gotta change the damn program. And, and it's interesting because I'm old enough from hippie days, you know, a long time ago, there was a famous saying back then that said, before you go out and change the world, clean up your own backyard. Yeah. And this is the point. People wanna rush out and change the world, but their own lives are not living in harmony with that world because 95% of the time, unconscious, they're playing these programs unconscious. And I, I've used the same story 30 years <laughs> more, uh, 40. Uh, but it's the point. The point is simply this. You have a friend. You know your friend's behavior very well. And you happen to know your friend's parent. And one day you see your friend has some of the same behavior as the parent. So you, you got to say stuff. You go, hey, Bill, you're just like your dad. Back away from Bill. I know what Bill's going to say before. As soon as you say it, I know what Bill's going to say. He says, how can you compare me to my dad? I'm nothing like my dad. And everyone laughs because they've had that experience. I go, most profound story. Why? Well, <laughs> everyone else can see that Bill behaves like his dad. The only one who doesn't see it is Bill. Yeah. Explain that. And the answer, of course, we just did. He got his dad's programs downloaded in the first seven years and 95% of his life, he's playing those programs. Why? Because his consciousness is not paying attention. He's thinking. So whatever program Bill is playing, his dad, Bill's the only one that doesn't see it. Everyone else sees it. I go, we are all Bill. That's the secret part. Our behavior is creating the problems for us and we didn't see our behavior because when we were executing those behaviors they were coming from a program and not from our conscious mind yeah. i've and got my five-year-old daughter uh, bruce and what are the most important top three programs to ensure that we you know download in terms of consciousness in terms of what you think is important that uh, are going to run her life uh, for many many years in the future right and this is so what's the point of all this well what was the consciousness that a person has when they experience in love 
in that honeymoon, which is heaven on earth. What consciousness is allowing for that? And I go, well, not the subconscious, because they're not, they're, they're creating. I say, but if you took the beliefs in that conscious mind, the one with the wishes and desires, and made those programs in the subconscious mind doing the three things we just said, then guess what? You have heaven on earth every day because if you start thinking and you default to the program, now the programs are what? Wishes and desires. Mm. And it says, this is the greatest understanding. Why? It's not a lifelong hardship to do this. You put the program in, let go. It's automatic behavior. It's been automatic behavior for your whole life anyway now, except the programs that you're playing are not ones that you installed. And if you want to change the programs, you can. And guess what? Once the program's in, do you have to do any more work? I say, no, look, 95% of the time, you're not even doing any work now and you're still manifesting the program. And, and that's the, the great resolution. It's like, oh, is life always gonna be a struggle? I go, the moment you change those programs, the struggle will disappear. Quite profound, hey? Tell us about just the hope, you know, the Greg Bradens, yourself, Joe Dispenza's, Kelly Brogram, you know, through this COVID pandemic, the evil, just the control. Where's our yeah. hope? Where's the future lying and how do we overcome this? I know there's a lot of communities getting together. How do you see it panning out as people sort of- The only way together? it's gonna pan out is, the only way I see it, uh, Steve, to pan out is they're gonna push people against the wall. And you get a large number of people against the wall and at some point people say, screw this. <laughs> and they rebel, okay? Does it have to be a, a violent rebellion? I go, no, it just has to be, I'm not doing that crap anymore. Rebel, you're a rebel. You're not following that program, you're a rebel. Uh, and they're doing everything they can to get all those rebels to be part of the system. Here in the States, oh man, you get this shot, you get a free dinner at a restaurant. If you get this shot, you're in a lottery for a million dollars. You get this shot, you get a gift from here. I, they're, they're bribing people to get this shot because inherently there's a, concern about this isn't working right and and so they're forcing people wear a mask if you didn't get vaccinated i go why is it relevant then all the people wearing masks are a separate population and then we say those people wearing the masks are the problems yeah. in germany <laughs> uh it was the jews uh, they got the little armband with a star those ones are the ones with the problem you know South Africa had its own issue yeah. with the same thing. It's not a local phenomenon, it's a global phenomenon. And the only way we evolve is globally. It's not gonna be one country evolves and all the rest are in the stone age. And, and this is why what we're seeing now is a global control, which is, you, we have to rebel against it. Why? Well, I'm a scientist and I, you know, I'm not going to go into it all right now, but this is, in my opinion, a, a, a one of the most terrible manipulations of human civilization I could ever imagine as a scientist. Uh, and we're doing an experiment on everyone. I said, what do you mean? This technology, <laughs> it's like mind blowing. This technology was illegal to use in humans until they declared it was an emergency, so let's use it. I said, it's never been used. We have no understanding what is the consequence of this virus with the messenger RNA, which is genetic engineering. No matter how much they say it's not, it is absolutely, by definition, genetic engineering, experimental. I go, so what's the result of this experiment? I said, hey, nobody knows. We've never done this before. And nobody has ever studied this before. And we were never allowed to use it. So congratulations, rats. You're all lab rats. Every one of you that's got this COVID vaccine with especially the Pfizer, Moderna, messenger RNA vaccine, it's like that is an illegal technology that is being foisted upon the public by scaring them and saying it's the only way out. And now that they're recognizing, well, most of the people got it, but they want the rest, they say, we have to scare them more. So the, the idea is from that British organization's idea is scare the public uh, so that everybody gets into the program. And I'll, I, my choice, I'm gonna be part of the control group. I'm gonna be part of those people that didn't get the shot and see what happens to me. <laughs> because I'm not gonna play with something that I know is one of the most dangerous games in the world is genetic manipulation. Uh, and this is clearly this as an experiment. Why do I say it's an experiment? 
It's never been done before. It's not even been done on lower organisms enough to see what is the consequence. So this is the first time an entire human population has been subjected to be an experimental rat. Hey, let's do it and see what happens. Oh, it's gonna be okay. Well, guess what? It's not okay. The side effects, the deaths are now reaching numbers that are like, Ooh, that wasn't the intention. So guess what? Where's the data? It's not available to the public. You have to search for it. Why? Because if the public starts to become aware of this is a very dangerous situation, uh, then even the fear is not going to motivate people to get that shot. Yeah. And I would never get that shot. Uh, being forced against the wall, which I, I am, because, oh, you don't have to get a vaccine. Oh, but you can't go to your job. You can't go to the concert. You can't go to the restaurant. You can't go on the airplane. I go, hey, I didn't have to get the shot, but now I can't do anything. <laughs> what the hell is that? You yeah. know, the, and that is, if forced, I would get a shot. The one I would get is still in the final stages of approval. It's called Novavax. And I say, why? It's the only traditional vaccine that has been shown to be safe after how many years of doing this kind of vaccine work, relatively safe compared mm -hmm. to this new stuff. Yeah. And the idea is I'm waiting for it because it doesn't involve genetic engineering. Yeah. Well, Bruce Lipton, I call you doctor because my tribe knows that doctor comes from the Latin docaria, which means teacher. And uh, I live by this, by Hippocrates said, the greatest medicine of all is to teach people how not to need it. And so you're a true doctor. You're a true teacher. I I'm love your, your work. I'm on your team. I'm <laughs> working I'm on with your team. you. Know? We're all yeah. doing this to do what? If knowledge is power. Yeah. And if I deprive you of knowledge, then you have no power. Yeah. And the government uh, has got this one source. This is the source of information about COVID. If anybody talks to you from outside the one source, mm -hmm. they're heretics. Don't look at them. They're the crazy ones. We're going to kill them because we always kill the heretics. You just follow the one source. And I go, that hasn't happened since about 500 AD when uh, the church had uh, the Inquisition said, this is a one source of knowledge. You, 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 you don't follow the one source of knowledge? We're gonna burn you at the stake. And this is what they're doing to any scientist who comes up with says, this one source is BS, uh, that's belief system. Uh, this one source uh, is, is a selection of data to support an end by the exclusion of data that says, this is one of the most dangerous things human population has ever been exposed to. Mm -hmm. Bruce, thank you so much for yeah. your time. Where can people connect with you? Where can they get your books? Where can oh, they just... It's so, uh, simple. It's so simple. BruceLipton.com. Yeah. Lots of downloadable videos, audio, written materials, everything mm -hmm. that we talk about. Uh, and my book, Especially Biology of Belief and Spontaneous Evolution Honeymoon Effect. Yeah. Uh, biology of Belief especially is probably in almost most bookstores everywhere. Yeah. Well, I declare favor and blessing upon you. I send joy, peace, fulfillment. You're a man who's in his 70s. I know you've got supernatural energy. I'm planning to live to 150. I'm sure you're going to get why, there. Why did you well. limit? Why did you limit to don't pick a number? Don't pick a number. <laughs> don't pick a number. You're going to be so proud. I am 150. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> you lived up to the number. You said the number. So yeah, don't say that. Yeah, that's a good now, point. It's a true story. Um, George Burns, a comedian from vaudeville days, he kept telling about, I'm going to be 100. I'm going to live to be 100. I'm going to live to be. And he did. And he died three days after his 100th birthday. Wow. Because he said, I'm going to live to be 100. He made 100 yeah. and then the game was over. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> it's true. End yeah, it's true. Maybe a fulfilling, content, content filled life till whenever, whatever number, I suppose. That's probably a better you know, declaration, but that, thank that you. Is, that's what it's about. And, yeah. and I have to say that once I, I started to apply this new biology to my own life, did it make a difference? At first it was just, oh, I'm smart. I could pass the test. Give me the questions, I'll answer them. I go, now that you're so smart, did your life change? I go, no, my, I still got the same stupid life. I go, so what was the point? Conscious awareness does not translate into subconscious program. You have to do the things we talked about yeah. to make a program change. So most of us are smart. 
but our lives are not expressing that because yeah. they're not coming from that part of our consciousness. Mm. And I suppose it takes work, Bruce, and that's the thing. And people aren't prepared to often put in the work. So they want the changes. They want the behavior changes. But it takes a lot of work, you know. But, well, there's uh, not a lot of work compared, you know, I mean, especially with what's called energy psychology. On my website, there are about 25 different modalities of energy psychology listed with websites. You can find one. Okay. And, uh, and, and the point about this is the idea of belief change being hard is a belief. <laughs> I've heard that from everybody. It's so hard. It's so hard. I say, well, now try and change your belief with that as the starting point. Yeah, and the answer is going to be hard because you've been saying it's hard. Program. It's not hard. Energy psychology can change a belief in minutes. All of a sudden, it's like, ooh, that's a Maybe give us belief. your top three energy psychology hacks or tips on your website. <laughs> the, the, you mean which ones do I prefer the most? Yeah, yeah. One, psych K, P S Y C H hyphen K dot com. Why? My whole life changed on a dime by engaging that. I wasn't able to write my book until I recognized that a subconscious program said that if you write this book, you're gonna be alienated from your community of biologists. And so my subconscious saying, don't write this book, don't write this book, and it would interfere 95% of the day, it'd interfere. And then change the belief, and then within weeks, all of a sudden the book just shot right out. As soon as I got rid of the fear that this book was gonna you know, cause a, a separation from the scientific community, which essentially it did. But then 10, 15 years after the book was published, uh, you know, people are now walking around saying, oh yeah, yeah, epigenetics, yeah, we know that stuff. I go, yeah, <laughs> I've been here. I, I did these experiments 1967. Wow, wow, wow. Good, Bruce, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And we'll send people to your website. And I think you've got, you got a good Instagram following as well, great Instagram feed. So. We'll send people there. We'll put that in the show notes. And uh, I hope this is not the only first occasion. I don't know if you've ever been to South Africa, but we'd love to have you here and host you here if you ever do come. And I would traveling. love that. You know, I, one of my most favorite films of all is the story of Rodriguez. Yes. South Africa. Yeah. Uh, it's a Cinderella story that's a true story, you know? Mm. And it's like, and, and when I saw that, it was like, <gasps> Oh my God, here's this guy doing day labor in, in yeah. Detroit in the winter time. And, and there's all these people thinking he's gone and dead. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. I, Searching for Sugar Man. Movie. It was brilliant. Great movie. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right, Bruce, thank you so much. And uh, I look off. appreciate this. I yeah. appreciate speaking to your audience because your audience, by definition, are the cultural creatives. And I said, what does that mean? These are people seeking answers outside of the box because there are no answers in the box. That's why the box is collapsing. Yeah, that's right. So I appreciate what yeah. you're doing. Thank appreciate you. Your audience.